Hi guys, in this video I'm going to show you how easy it is to use Spark Streaming in real life and how you can understand Spark Streaming through a practical example. Now on YouTube and on other uh, platforms there are a lot of tutorials and like uh, articles that explain Spark Streaming and what it is and why it's useful but they don't really go through a practical examples so that you can understand it better by actually working with it. So in this video, this is what I'm trying to accomplish, all right? I'm gonna try to use a data set from Kaggle that is related to credit card transactions. And we're going to see how we can uh, stream that data and use it with Spark Streaming. Now, before I start, I just wanna thank you guys for subscribing to our channel and for liking our videos. I hope that they are helpful and I really encourage you to write me down in the comments any topics that you might find interesting when it comes to applied data science so that I can add them to my backlog and create better videos that can help you guys out. So thank you again for checking our channel out and let's continue on with, uh, with the tutorial. So Spark Streaming is a key requirement in many big data applications because as soon as an application computes something, let's say a report about some customer activity like credit card transactions, or I don't know, a new machine learning model, then the business will want to compute the result or the prediction continuously in a production setting. That's why Spark Streaming is so important. And in this video, we're gonna talk specifically about structured streaming. Now, an example use case, and this is what I'm gonna go through today, is when a bank, let's say whatever bank, wants to verify customer transactions. And they want to make sure that those transactions aren't fraudulent because they want to check based on the recent history and other rule-based metrics or even machine learning models, they can find whether a transaction is uh, fraudulent. So the bank needs to process each transaction or a batch of those processes, let's say, uh, each transaction that comes in gets collected and then uh, gets outputted by a job every hour and then that job just outputs a file with the with all of the transactions that happened in the past five seconds or five minutes or 30 seconds or an hour and therefore it runs some computations against that and then decides whether those transactions could be fraudulent or not. And this is exactly what we're going to do today, okay? We're gonna use a Kaggle data set, a, a synthetic financial data set, so we can check whether certain transactions may be, may be fraudulent, okay? I'm not gonna implement the, the machine learning solution, but I'm just gonna show you how streaming works and how the pipeline uh, analyzes each, each uh, batch of, of data that comes in. Let's go ahead and uh, look at our data set. Now, this data set is specifically interesting because we have this step column that maps a unit of time in the real world, okay? So in this case, one step is one hour of time. So this is very helpful for us because we can split this data set into these small batches that form other data sets. Let's see exactly how we can, uh, how we can do that. Let's create a Spark session first, and then let's read this data. So you need to get the data from Kaggle. I already have it in this folder, so I renamed it PaySim. I already downloaded it, but you can definitely go to Kaggle and download the data as well. You can use the Kaggle API as well. I have a video on how you can use the Kaggle API to download data without actually needing to go to Kaggle. So now let's go ahead and read this CSV file and let's see also the columns. So again, we have step type amount, name origin, and you, say, you see we already have two columns that we don't need here. We have is fraud and is flagged fraud. So for our streaming system, of course, we won't know whether it's fraud or not. I'm just gonna remove these columns and let's see what we have. We have everything else. So as I was saying, the step uh, column maps a unit of time in the real world, right? As per the documentation. So in this case, one step is one hour. Of course, it can be five minutes, it can be five seconds, it can be any predefined amount of time. We can assume for this example that we have another job, as I was saying, that runs every hour or every other time frame and gets the transactions in that time frame and then 
outputs them to a sync to, um, to a file in this scenario. Let's go ahead and see the value counts. So we see if we just show the first three, we can see that for step 148, we have 12 transactions. And then for 436, we have 10. And then 471, we have 2000 transactions. Okay, so this is very, very useful. Okay, because now what we can do, we can save this output of a specific job by filtering on each step and saving it to a separate file. Now, this is exactly what we're doing here. I commented this out because I already ran this and it takes a whole bunch of time. What we're doing here, we're just getting the distinct steps and we get a list of those steps. And then we go through this list and for each step, then we uh, filter that data frame by uh, where the step is equal to that specific step. And then we, we write this uh, data frame to a file, all right? And here we're using coalesce, and this helps us save the data frame to one file. Otherwise, we would get a whole bunch of files. So we will get one file for each step. Now, if we run this, again, it will take a whole bunch of time, so I'm not gonna run it now because I already ran it before to save you precious time. So if we go to this folder, we can see all of the CSV files that were created by the step above. So we have all these files, and if we would read, let's say, let's say we would read one of them. Okay, let's, let's read the first one. Let's see what we have here. If we read this and then we get the, the distinct values, we have only one step, of course, because this is exactly what we wanted to do, get a data frame for each step. And the counts, we have 438 transactions that happened in that specific hour, hour 458. If we would check another one, let's, let's just check this one. If we run this, and again, we can see that at this step, we only had 10 transactions. So by this example, we can see practically how Spark streaming works. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how you can use structured streaming. And in the simplest terms, structured streaming is just your data frame, but streaming. So it's a very, very simple concept. The main idea is that you treat the stream of data as a table to which data is continuously appended. The job itself, then it checks for the new input data, then it processes it, updates the internal state, and then updates the result. It's extremely simple. So I'm gonna show you that through this practical example. Let's go ahead and now we're going to create a streaming version of this input. So we're gonna read each file one by one as it was a stream. Let's get first the data schema. And because we started off from the initial big data frame that already had a schema, we can just take uh, the schema of this small partition. And if we check this, the schema, we have, of course, we have the step, type, amount, and all of the other columns, all right? So now we can create a streaming version of this data set, which will read each input file in this data set one by one as it was a stream. So streaming data frames are pretty much as static data frames. We create them within the Spark application and then we perform transformations and then we get our data into a correct format. What we need to do now is simply create the stream, all right? And we're gonna use the schema and we're gonna specify this option, maximum files per trigger. We're gonna set it to one. All right, so max files per trigger allows us to control how quickly Spark will read all of the files in this folder. In this example, we're gonna limit the flow to just one file per trigger because we want to, to do that incrementally, okay? Now let's run this and now we set up our stream and we're using the data that is located in the pacing folder. So we're gonna go through all of those files one by one. So now we can set up the transformation. 
This is going to be a very simple example. We're just going to first group by the name destination, the name destination being the recipient ID of the transaction. Then we're going to count, okay? And then we're going to order them uh, descending. Because the rationale that I'm thinking about now is that if, let's say, you get multiple transactions that end up uh, depositing money or uh, to a specific um, account, then that might be potential fraud, okay? Like if multiple clients send money to the same account, that could be fraudulent. Of course, this is just a very basic example. It doesn't necessarily have to be like that, but uh, I just thought about a use case and this is the simplest use case so we can see this in action. So now we can run this and again, we, we are grouping by, okay? This name destination, we count how many transactions are to the same destination and then we order them descending. So now that we have our transformation, all we need to do is specify the output sync of the results. So for this example, we're just going to write to memory. There are multiple syncs that you can use, but for this example, we're just going to write to memory because we want to keep those results in memory. And we also need to define how Spark will output that data. So in this example, we're going to use the complete output mode. Okay, so we're going to rewrite all the keys along with their counts after every trigger. So let's go ahead and see how this looks like. So we're going to create an activity query. So we're going to use this query name, destination counts, and we're going to run this query on the actual transformation on destination counts. So we're going to write the stream and then we're going to set the sync to memory. And then we're going to also use the output mode complete. So this is the actual activity query that will run for the stream to be written. And we're not going to include this because await termination is always required to prevent the driver process from terminating when the stream is active. So if we would run this in, uh, in this Jupyter notebook, this will run constant, continuously and we won't be able to get the results and play around with, uh, with that. So we're not going to include it in this Jupyter notebook. But in production, you definitely need to, to add that. And afterwards, what we will do, we're just going to create a simple for loop in which we're going to select from that location, from the query name, destination counts that we specified here. And we're going to search for all the records that have a count greater or equal than two. This is just a very simple example. So you can see if there are certain destinations that had more than two transactions coming in. We're going to see exactly. It will only print results if the data frame has any values. Let's wait it off a bit. And you can see this is the first, the first result. And we're just going to get it's just going to parse through each file and then it's going to check to see all these results. So you see with each file in that destination, our Spark streaming uh, query performs that transformation on the data available in each file. So you can see how easy it is to use Spark streaming in a real world application. We're going to wait for this to finish. And now that this finished, we can check if our stream is active and we can also check the status. You can see it processes new data. And if we want to turn off the stream, we'll just run stop to reset the query for testing purposes. Okay. So we can stop it. And what we can do now, we can just create other transformations and try out other types of transformations that we want to apply to this, to this type of data set.